Um, good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Swan and Olive Valley. My name is Sally Smith and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. Um, Unitarian Universalism is a welcoming tradition informed by many sources. Um, and you, if you need to learn a little bit more about us, you can look at the mission statement on the front of your order of service or and or at the eight principles that guide us on the inside of your order of service. Uh, we like to say that we don't have to think alike to love alike. Um, it's our tradition here to welcome first or second or even third time visitors or people who have been away for a while to stand and introduce themselves if they're comfortable. Um, is there anybody on this side who's new who would like to introduce themselves? No one on that side? Okay, how about on this side? Or can I uh, introduce myself uh, last week? My name is Steve Dunn, and uh, I'm just uh, starting to come around. I think that this will be a, uh, it fits me. And uh, i looking for a church family. I, I live alone down, like I said, that, down there, down towards one and all. And I'm just looking for a, uh, a family of like-minded folks. And what I've read, and I talked with uh, Michael a week or two ago, and uh, this, uh, I think this works, works for my craziness. So. Welcome. <laughs> uh, if there's anyone else here who would like to learn, oh, another new person? Yes. Oh, my name's Evan gave you away. <laughs> My name's Karen, and I'm, I'm just visiting. I'll be here for another couple weeks. Okay. And I used to belong to a Unitarian church when my kids were little, and I still stop in once in a while. And I was really happy to hear about the care committee. And oh, what welcome. You're doing. Yeah. I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about us, there should be a white card either um, in the hymnal in front of you or the... Um, maybe in the queue somewhere, or you can find one out in the lobby, and just fill that out, and that will tell us how to keep in touch with you in whatever way that you choose. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to, to uh, turn off your cell phones, and also I know that Larry Perlman's got um, announcements that he would like to make, so Larry, why don't you come on up, wherever you are. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> A um, couple of announcements. One, you may have noticed in um, the newsletter this week, and if you're not reading your newsletter, we have newsletter police who will come and whip you. But um, if you did read the newsletter, you know that we're starting to get ready to commence, to begin, to plan this year's auction. And if you want to, if you want to get in on the fun and be part of the auction committee, um, let me know by email or by phone, and um, we'll get you. Uh, started on that. The other thing is, you'll find on the credenza in that room back there on your way out, this sheet, it's a grief and bereavement uh, seminar interest survey. And because there has been so much in the last two years, uh, people, almost all of us know somebody who has died or is caring for somebody who's too sick. And you might be interested in this. Um, just mark down when you leave. You don't have to put your name on it, or it would make it easier to contact you. Um, and just fill it out. This is just to give us an idea of, is there interest in the congregation to have a series of seminars on grief and bereavement and how to handle things appropriately? So if you think you might be interested, this does not commit you. It's just, we're trying to get a feel how many people might be interested, and we'll go from there. Thank you. And with that, let our service begin.
Helen, and it's a beautiful reminder for us, even in winter, especially in winter, to get outside, find the appropriate clothing, and uh, experience some forest reverie. And uh, my name is Lee Redding. I'm a member of the Sunday Service Associates. We're a volunteer group, uh, one of our committees. And when our, uh, Reverend Michael Carter isn't in the pulpit, we, we recruit outside speakers. And uh, we're delighted this Sunday to welcome back uh, Eric and Helen, um, all the way from Durham, North Carolina. They're members of the Eno River Fellowship over there. Um, and they're retired IT people. <laughs> Eric says, yeah, back when computers were made out of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Another remar remarkable factoid is this guy kind of grew up on rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And something tells me it was, it was Helen's influence that introduced him to Celtic and sacred music like we just listened to. Uh, so uh, we're, we're glad that they're with us today. And, and uh, when they came in early, and, and thank you, David Reed, our sound engineer, to help them get set up and get this, this uh, music sounding good for us. Um, they were still a little euphoria because last night they stayed with friends over at Highland Farms and did a little house concert and they were they played music for human beings. Which, <laughs> if you're a professional musician, that that you know you're starved for that human interaction to have people appreciate your music. They got to do that last night and we get to enjoy their music today. So we light our chalice this morning with these words from the 19th century Unitarian minister, Edward Everett Hale. He says, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. These words are a tribute to Kalidasa, a Sanskrit poet from the fifth century. Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision, but the day well lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. We're not comfortable with congregational singing, so we're doing this instead. <laughs>
Fellowship, the Eno River Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, or ERA for short, includes a line something like, We are so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday morning with us. This Sunday morning, we're going to explore why humanists like me and Eric, who don't believe in a higher power beyond the collective power of humanity, choose over and over again to come to a place that looks an awful lot like a place where people gather to worship the higher power that we don't believe in. <laughs> we hope that this exploration will encourage you to reflect on why, whatever your cosmology, you made the choice to be here this morning. I don't remember exactly when I gave up on God. There was a time in elementary school when I borrowed a Catholic catechism, hid <laughs> it under my pillow, prayed and said the rosary. <laughs> it was so reassuring to have someone know not only the questions to ask, but also the answers. But somewhere early in adolescence, God and I parted company. I wish I could remember if there was some particular catalyst that precipitated my rejection of the supernatural being, or if it was just a logical progression of events. In any case, with God out of my life, I saw no reason to go to church. And for decades, the only time I crossed the threshold of a religious institution was for a wedding or a memorial service. By the spring of 1997, though, some 35 years later, although I still didn't believe in God, I was pretty well ensconced in a church-like place called the Eno River Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Durham, North Carolina. How had that happened? At the time, it would have been easy for me to articulate several reasons why I chose to spend my Sunday mornings at Eva. First of all, I wanted my children to be exposed to and to explore different paths, to connect with other adults who were likely to share my ethical outlook, and to meet other children whose families didn't fit the traditional religious mold. Quite simply, I wanted them to know that Unitarian Universalism existed in case at any point in their lives they needed it. And you can imagine how thrilled I was one time a few years ago when my 35-ish year old son sent me a picture from inside the UU Fellowship in Laguna Beach, California. <laughs> <clears throat> Another reason that compelled me to choose EREF Sunday morning after Sunday morning was the desire to contribute to making the world a better place. 
This value had been instilled in me by both my parents, but especially my mother, a registered nurse who stopped working when she married and devoted her life to raising children and to volunteer work. She set an example as a do-gooder that was impossible for me as a single working parent at the time to live up to. She single-handedly started the Trick or Treat for UNICEF program in the city where I grew up. She volunteered in school libraries. She wrote to all 100 senators whenever she was upset about something. <laughs> and mind you, this was before personal computers and email. <laughs> and during the Vietnam War, she helped countless young men obtain conscientious objector status or medical deferments. Her guiding philosophy, as she told me once after I had expressed the simple desire to be happy, was, you weren't put here to be happy. You were put here to do good. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack in that statement from my agnostic mother, but here I simply want to say that in 1997, I could have told you that one reason I went to ERA was that I understood that as part of this community, I would be made aware of and educated about injustices near and far great and small, and that ERUF could facilitate my finding ways to help make the world a better place <clears throat> in the small, erratic ways that fit my life as a single parent. A third reason for my Sunday morning choice was expressed in a letter that I wrote, postmarked May 12, 1997. My younger brother, Charlie, had been haranguing me to place a personal ad in our local progressive weekly newspaper. I put him off, insisting that in order to make myself stand out, I'd have to say that I did origami and that I tried the hammer dulcimer, and that all of my friends who read the personals for amusement would immediately recognize me. <laughs> Charlie had succeeded, however, in getting me to look at the personals, and there, to my surprise, I found an ad that was refreshingly day to day. It wasn't focused on the usual things like walking on the beach, dining with candlelight, hiking with a tree line, all things a single parent of young children can't do thereafter. And in the middle of the ad was one word, non-religious. It was a no-brainer that I should answer this ad from the Eastern North Carolina native who is now my husband. The only part that gave me any pause was this non-religious thing. It delighted me that he wasn't religious and that he would say so to the entire world in a personal ad. But how would I explain to someone who quite possibly had no idea what Unitarian Universalism was, why a humanist like me went to a church-like place? Here is what I said. I am non-religious in that I don't believe in any power higher than the goodness in and the connections among people. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Durham. A colleague recently asked me if the UU denomination was religion with God optional. <laughs> I have to say that although it sounds a bit absurd, for me that isn't far from the truth. It is important for me to have this community of folks with similar ideals with whom to talk, to work, and to play. So there you have it. In 1997, my third reason, and the one that I chose when I had limited space, was community. While being a part of an ethical community continues to be an important part of why both Eric and I come to ERA year in and year out, we've also come to understand that being in community isn't just an end in itself. Being in community provides the substrate for powerful experiences that you simply cannot have on your own. One of the most obvious of these is what the Unitarian Universalist Association designated as the theme for our 2019 General Assembly, the power of we. When we're part of the Unitarian Universalist community, we can do so much more than we can do alone because it's only in some kind of community that we can have shared principles and shared goals. Alone you can have dreams and you can work to make those dreams come true. And in a community, we can dream together of the world we want to create, and we can work together to make that world a reality. In community, we dream and work and play together. When we tire, someone else can shoulder more. When you succeed, others will celebrate your success. When you stumble, others will lift you up. Our shared vision of the future is kept alive in many hearts so that our personal ups and downs don't derail our progress. Discouragement and despair 
don't exactly evaporate in the face of community, but they're easier to manage, and they lose some of their power. So please join us now as we pause to reflect on the power of community. A few years ago, our fellowship worked together to develop a bold vision statement. This statement didn't come to us from a divinity or even from an ecclesiastic hierarchy. It came from the hard work of members and friends of the congregation, and it describes our collective vision for the era of the near future. So take a moment now to find as comfortable a position as you can, to close your eyes if you choose, and to focus on your breath. Let's take a deep breath in together and let it out slowly. And another. As Eric and I read this vision statement, I ask that you continue to breathe slowly and listen with all of your being to the commitment that our members have made to each other. While the words themselves are specific to our fellowship, I suspect that the sentiments are not. We are a vibrant, diverse, engaged community where spirits are nourished, ideas thrive, and love finds action. We are welcoming and radically inclusive. We recognize and value the humanity of all who come through our doors. We actively <coughs> and courageously work for racial, economic, social, and environmental justice and are deeply committed to dismantling the divisive cultures of dominance in our society. Grounded by our principles, we radiate love, joy, and a spirit of generosity. Our deep connections sustain us and fuel both spiritual and personal growth. We are a visible force for justice, equity, and compassion in our community as we live into the ultimate transformative power of love. Let us join in silence as we consider this awesome vision of the power of community. We'll follow the silence with a musical meditation by rock and roller, Eric. <laughs>
really one reason we come together on Sundays is because we are a community that cares for each other. And in that spirit, we set aside a portion of the service to uh, invite anyone who would like to come forward and share with Jordan or a song that you're experiencing in your life. So please come forward. morning. I'm Roberta Madden, and I have a joy to share. It was almost 100 years ago that the Equal Rights Memo was first introduced, uh, and I've been working on it all that time, actually. Not, <laughs> not 99 years, but I have been working on it for about 50 years. And on the 27th of January, uh, we celebrated actually the inclusion in our Constitution of the Equal Rights Amendment. It was passed as required by the Constitution by three-fourths of the states, that's 38 states, and then two years go by to, to put it into effect. So that's where it is right now. Yet, however, there is one little technicality. The U.S archivist, the National Archivist, has not yet published it, and he's been urged to do so, but the problem is there's still a regulation that was put in by the previous presidential uh, administration, which said that you can't do it, and so the archivist is going by that. Meanwhile, the president has spoken out, and President Biden has spoken out in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. And he's saying now the only thing holding it up is for Congress to go ahead and, and say that it is the 28th Amendment. Meanwhile, I have a copy of it that has the 28th Amendment in it. This was published by the Columbia Law School ERA project. So I'm very happy with that one slight uh, worry. Um, I'm exhilarated, in fact. I'm Larry Perlman. I have a concern and a joy to share. Today, um, last week, I announced that um, Jackie Franklin's sister Kay uh, had an aneurysm that was in the kind of abdominal kidney area and went to the hospital in Brawley. And she had driven down there to be with her sister. Um, they found out that it was an emergency, so she wanted to put off the surgery until it was coming Monday or Tuesday. Um, but now they've just found uh, that it's getting worse. So she is being operated on either yesterday or today. I haven't heard from Jackie yet. Um, she's still down there. Case's daughter has come to Raleigh to be with her, so she's got some encompassment um, in that regard. But if you give prayers, it's great. If you do meditations, it's great. If you just send out loving thoughts, whatever you like to do for Jackie and her sister Kay. My joy this past week was Marty's birthday. I think her 38th or 39th, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Um, she can you know, tell you about that. But the joy was that uh, at the auction, did I mention the auction today? <laughs> anyway, at the auction last year, I was one of the lucky people that bought the four desserts a year from Alice. And my first choice was Never make a carrot cake because that's my favorite for her birthday. And we were going to eat just a little piece and then freeze the rest because <laughs> Alice made this cake that could fit the, feed the fifth fleet. And um, <laughs> but we ended up going through a lot more than I liked it. It was wonderful. And Alice brought a cake today, cut in little tiny squares with toothpicks so people don't have to cut it or touch it. And if you want to save her some of that, you can do that. And it will be your joy too. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, David Reed, and um, several weeks ago, my wife and I, Jane, made a quick decision to welcome 
one of the Afghan, young Afghan families into our basement apartment just because we had it available and hearing that they had a great need and all these Afghans were coming to Asheville. We were humbled to be able to provide that. Um, my joy is that the way this congregation has rallied behind and supported this effort, um, our care committee and circle of welcome. So I just want to say that this congregation puts their principles into action and we are grateful. And it's going to be a challenge for these families coming in. Um, some of them don't know any English. Some of them don't read and write their own language, although they speak it. And to come into Asheville, as you can imagine, and try to find housing and be independent under these circumstances is going to be extremely challenging. So um, I'm proud of the community, and I just wanted to express my appreciation. Thank you. Well, I'd like to um, I can light, it, light a candle for uh, Jenny Parker, and and she comes here, yeah, fairly often, and uh, she's been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, but it's in situ, so but it's not a great place. Um, so anyway, uh, just hold her in your thoughts. Um, I think it's next week that she goes in. Um, uh, not a biopsy, but the other thing, they take it out, see, see what it is. <laughs> so, hold, hold Jenny in your thoughts. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Heidi. And many years ago, when people started getting Priuses, I really wanted one. Well, yesterday I got a plug-in hybrid Ionic. So it's a step in hopefully the right direction. I wish there was a magic cure for this planet, but I got an Ionic. <laughs> I've lit a, a candle, it's concern and joy. This story involves my older brother who's 75. Um, he lives in our hometown of Davenport, Iowa. And to escape a fairly brutal Midwestern winter, he and uh, his wife Kathy went down to Naples, Florida. Uh, they drove down there on the 1st of February. And uh, uh, the next morning he got up and like he has done for many years, uh, had his morning coffee and went out for a walk and said goodbye to Kathy, didn't say when he'd be back. And several hours later, she got really worried. Where, where is this guy? Well, he had the big heart attack while he was out walking with no identification and a good Samaritan found him crumpled on the sidewalk and started chest compressions. And uh, somebody with a cell phone brought in um, 911 paramedics arrived it, it took four uh, shocks from a defibrillator to bring him back. Mm -hmm. So he, he's in the hospital, he's conscious, he's alive. He has, uh, all of his ribs are broken, <laughs> as you can imagine, but he's alive. So um, carry ID when you go out on a bike ride or for your walk in the woods. And uh, uh, try to keep your arteries clean and that heart pumping. So we'll light one more candle for any um, unspoken concerns that someone may be holding. And, uh, thank
vision statement that Iraq Games created is one example of the strength of community. It's a powerful vision that none of us could have created alone and that none of us can fulfill alone. In community, we amplify each other's dreams and actions to make a bigger impact on the world. What other advantages does a community like ours provide? Next on my list is a broad native perspective. A UU fellowship provides multiple opportunities for people to share their thoughts and experiences. At ERA, these opportunities include reflections by lay people during the services, our spectacular um, spiritual odyssey sessions in the summer in which people share their spiritual journeys, and small groups of workshops. In these places, people who've had different experiences from me or have thought about things differently share their often astonishing and moving stories. You would have to have a heart of stone not to be moved by the many examples of create, create, courageous sharing that happen as you use pursue our third and fourth principles, which are acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations and a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. These opportunities provide much for the mind and heart to consider, and my perspective on so many things has been broadened by hearing about experiences and thoughts so different from my own. I believe that we each get exactly one life to live, and in community we share our life experiences so that we can benefit from other people's lives. We may not get more than one life, but we can share the wisdom garnered from the lives that others live. So far, I've given you a number of reasons why a humanist like me might choose to spend Sunday morning at a UU fellowship instead of at home making pancakes and reading the paper. They include wanting a re liberal religious experience for my children, wanting to help make the world a better place, wanting to be part of a community, and wanting to experience the broadened perspectives and the amplification of goals and efforts that a community provides. However, for me, at this point in my life and in my journey as a UU, the most compelling reason for me to continue showing up on Sunday mornings, even when the siren song of other options is strong, is the knowledge that attending UU services has a way of reminding me how precious life is. Many, but not all of us, believe that the life we're living now is the only one we'll have. All of us believe that each day is precious. These ideas may sound obvious, but an all too common part of being human is to go on autopilot. We don't necessarily take life itself for granted. Great story for that point. Sometimes we take this particular day or this particular person or this particular routine for granted. Poets, I think, are better at remembering the ephemeral nature of life than most of us. UU services, where poetry often takes the place that scripture would take in a more traditional venue, are rife with poetic reminders. Our opening words today, look to this day, capture the essence of the value of the moment as beautifully as anything I've ever heard. And it was from a UU minister more than 15 years ago that I first heard the poem from Jenny Joseph that begins, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat that doesn't go and doesn't suit me. The poet goes on to detail the things that she is waiting to do, like going out in her slippers in the rain and learning to spit, and ends, but maybe I ought to practice a little now, so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and start wearing purple. When I first heard this poem all those years ago, I began to wonder what I was putting off. Spinning isn't high on my list, but immersed as I was in what I was doing, I hadn't given much thought to what I wasn't doing. And that poem definitely planted a seed. It was in another UU service that I first heard the often quoted gem from the late poet Mary Oliver that ends, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? The guest minister that day spoke about callings and I had no idea what she meant. A calling seemed to me like a tap on the shoulder from a deity in the sky and I knew that wasn't gonna happen. Then one day in a parent education seminar at my son's school, I connected with a woman who like me 
sought respite from stress and playing music. As we were discussing the refuge that we found in making music, she told me that she'd been trained by the Music for Healing and Transition Program, or MHTP, to play music at bedside for those who needed refuge, people who were chronically or terminally ill. And at that moment, something in my mind lit up. And I knew that playing bedside was something that I wanted to do. Back at home, I located the MHTP training center nearest to me. I put in the coursework, read the books, spent a year trying to get the 45 hours of hammers on the strings experience that I needed to fulfill the requirements for the certificate. By the time I earned the certificate, I was a volunteer at two hospices and had played for numerous hospice patients as well as residents in assisted living and for homebound patients. As I played for these people, I came to understand that what I experienced when I first heard about playing at bedside was a calling, not by some deity up in the sky who was finally speaking to me about what I was supposed to do, but by my most authentic self. And it was telling me where my gifts could best meet the world's needs. The only problem was that I didn't have the time to make bedside music a substantial part of my life. But once you're called, it's difficult to escape answering the call, especially if you frequent a UU community. There are just so many thought-provoking ideas presented and so many opportunities to think and talk about what's really important that it's hard to avoid examining your life. Eventually, I reached the conclusion that although it would be improved to quit my day job altogether, I needed to make a change that would enable me to spend more time playing therapeutic music. Then I had to convince my employer to give me back a third, to give, to let me give back a third of my salary in exchange for their giving me back a third of the precious heartbeats that I had been giving them. I am confident that I wouldn't have radically altered my everyday work routine and taken a big pay cut if I hadn't heard one year you minister after another speaking about how precious life is, about how we each have our own gifts and about how we are called to use our gifts to make the world a better place. They encouraged me to examine my priorities and to make critical choices that required me to let go of the familiar routine of my life and step into the unknown. I worked this part-time schedule for three years, then opted to retire early, which allowed me to devote even more time to playing therapeutic music. Although I began this journey before EREF had articulated its mission, our mission statement helped me put the journey in perspective. EREF's mission includes the intention to transform lives by building a free and inclusive covenantal religious community. And by golly, EREF and Unitarian Universalism in general have transformed my life. I tended to think of transformation as a sudden thing like Paul's transformation on the road to Damascus. And I guess sometimes it is. But in my case, this transformation was wrought incrementally over years in a slow but steady path that in retrospect seems inevitable, but really was anything but. It took a village and it took years for me to do the discernment and find the path I now follow. As I look back over my years as a therapeutic musician, I realized that this transformation wasn't just about me. I have played for hundreds of critically ill people, residents in various facilities, families, visitors, and staff. I've watched the heart monitors on agitated babies plummet within a minute of my starting to play. I've seen exhausted parents in the pediatric intensive care unit put their heads down on their child's bed and go to sleep for the first time in far too long. I played for a hospice, hospice patient's wedding. I've had staff tell me how relaxing and peaceful the music is, and I've been approached by other musicians who want to learn more about doing this work. Clearly, this work that I'm called to do reaches beyond me and transforms the lives of others. I know little or nothing about most of the people that I play for. I wouldn't recognize them if I passed them on the street. Yet the music connects us and allows me to bring the transformative power of music and human concern into the world. Therapeutic music is the one thing that I do that I am confident makes the world a better place. But the inspiration to change my life, to follow my heart's calling, wasn't the end of the road. I still get up most Sunday mornings and attend a UU service. 
My experience has taught me that a UU fellowship, indeed the UU community at large, is awash in big ideas and in people who are passionately committed to them. It's full of people searching for meaning in their lives, full of people who want to transform the world into a loving, sustainable, equitable, just community of human beings, recognizing that no two of them are alike. Unitarian Universalism puts more ideas in front of us than we can possibly process. You never know which Sunday morning service or which small group discussion will catch hold of your heart. You never know when transformation for you and by extension for the world is just around the corner. So get up on Sunday morning and come. I can look back at my path over the last 15 or 20 years and marvel at the changes and the role that the UU community has played in them. And if I'm lucky enough to live another 15 years, I hope that I'll look back in similar amazement at the changes in my life and at the important role that this community has played in determining the course of my life. I may be a non-theist, but going to services in UU communities has transformed my life and the lives of those I interact with. I highly recommend it to theist and non-theist alike. We all have so many needs, a thousand prayers, a thousand needs that really need one answer, let the world not be indifferent. And may we live and be with each other in the way that shows this truth, whatever the day brings, that we are not indifferent to each other. An offering will now be given and received in grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values. to stay home maintain a leisurely pace instead I get dressed and looking my best come here to this church life place my community's here in fellowship we're here embracing the whole human race support for ourselves and justice for all who in this church like me. Atheists and Jew, Christians and a few, folks just looking for their place. They're all welcome here. They enter with no fear, embraced by this church like me.
consider issues of morality, justice, wealth, class, and race. Standing together in solidarity, united in this church like place. We think about things that matter in life, the issues that all people face. Our mission is nutrition of the human condition. We all flourish in this church like place. We all flourish in this church like generosity and great thanks to Helen and Barry for sharing your music and your message with us today. We close with these words from One Light Many Windows by the late Union Minister Forrest Church. So why do we choose to join together rather than exercise our full freedom to believe what we will in the privacy of our homes on Sunday mornings. Simply because evidence has taught us that we need one another. We need guidance in recognizing our tears in one another's eyes. We need prompting to raise our sights and companions in the work of love and justice, to enhance our neighborhood, and to strengthen our witness in the world. And yes, we choose to gather here because we know how easily we slip back into mechanical habits that blunt our consciousness. We need and know that we need to be reminded week in and week out how precious life is, how wondrous and magical, how truly miraculous. Not only to be reminded of these things for our own sake, but the sake of our loved ones and our neighbors as well. Forest Church. Go in peace, my friends. Thank you.